I still hope you have a lot of fun to listen a little bit about best practice with Nelly and what you can do to get the maximum out of performance. It's kind of, well, a shortened version of this talk that I gave at Facebook this year before, but I also include a little bit of more new content. So I hope it's still interesting to the guys that also attend the Facebook talk. So yeah, let's get started. So what I want to talk about today, well, I want to talk about HTTP, well, mostly because a lot of people use Netty for HTTP stuff, or at least for protocols that are like HTTP, like re uh, request, response, and this kind of things, which includes also pipelining, so how you improve pipelining performance, um, how you handle close, uh, slow clients for uh, back pressure, writing gracefully so you don't get out of memory exceptions and this kind of stuff, about buffers, how you make the best use of buffers, how you can do pull updates, search and buffers without too much overhead like range checks and this kind of stuff. And also about our, well, threading model and the event loop which powers the whole threading I.O. and all that kind of things. So here you see a code example for using Natty for HTTP stuff. So basically what we do here is we have an inbound handler, that's how we call it, which gets notified once, once you receive an HTTP request. So what we do here is, well, we just take the request and create a new response, which is not shown here in the slides because I just want to make it simple and fit it on the slide. So you create it and call write and flush, which means, well, write it through the pipeline back to the, to the remote peer and flush it on the socket, which returns in this fact, a channel future, because everything we do is non-blocking by nature. And with the channel future, well, if it's not keep alive HTTP, we just add a listener to close the connections, and so, well, make the response complete. Well, this works out pretty good. And uh, this works also for all the cases. It works for pipelining, non-pipelining, and all that kind of things. But it's expensive. But why is it expensive? Basically because we say write it through the pipeline and flush it to the socket, which means you do a syscall. And syscalls are pretty expensive in these terms. So what we can do to optimize this for protocols which allow to do, for example, pipeline like HTTP, which means you get a lot of requests and are allowed to write them all the responses with one call, for example. You just need to make sure that the same, well, the same order is guaranteed over the, well, the responses. With Netty4, we are, well, basically split up the write and the flushing from to a socket in two different operations. What you, what you did in Netty3 was you called channel write, which basically means fire through the pipeline and do a channel write or a socket channel write. So do a syscall. But with Netty4, you can do something like that's shown here. So we have this channel read method, which is called for a new, new request. Then we do um, just a write on, well, through the pipeline, but we don't flush it yet on the socket. We just say, write it through the pipeline, transform it, do encoding, whatever, but store it in some kind of an outbound buffer. And once there's nothing left to read from the socket, in this, in this event loop, then flush everything out that you have in the outbound buffer, which allow us to do something like a gathering write. So we do one syscall and write, for example, 10 byte buffers at once, which is a lot faster and has less overheads than doing write and flush for every call. And that's not only possible for HTTP. You can also do that for other protocols like Memcache, whatever, or even now on Swift. I just learned in Swift it's also possible now to do this kind of stuff. So you should definitely move to Netty4. I mean, <laughs> that's the reason. I mean, now you can block some time and tell your manager that you need this. Then also what we, what we had in the past was when you created a new HTTP, mass, uh, HTTP request or response, you pass it out, out of the bytes, we validated the headers all the time. But validation is pretty expensive because 
what we did was we checked every byte that we read, is it really use ASCII, which it, which it needs to be if you want to conform the RFC. But most of the times you don't care. I mean, if there's something else like UTF-8 or whatever, you don't care. I mean, you just try to read it, and if you can't read it, that's it. So what we allow now is um, to disable validation because that gives you a nice performance boost. And if you really want to validate, you just enable it, and that's it. Per default, we still have it enabled just because, well, backward compatibility, because we had it uh, done before. But in newer versions, you can just pass in some constructor arguments and say, well, I'm not interested in validating. I want to do validating by myself or just don't care at all and get a performance boost for free. Um, another nice thing that we introduced was um, in Eddy 4.0, it's, it's called uh, HTTP headers new identity. Um, that basically allows you to create static header values or names that you write a lot of times. Because most of the times, at least the header names itself are reused because they are all the same. I mean, for example, content lengths, well, transfer encoding, all that kind of things. You use it all the time. So what we allow to do is, well, we create a special child sequence which has pre-encoded this header to the bytes. And this allows us to just do a pull write without encoding all the time. And that's also one of the things that really improves performance because you don't need to do the encoding, you don't get the latency and all that kind of things. And you can do the same thing also for values. It's, it's kind of the same like duplicating a buffer for the content. You just do the same for the headers. And here in the example, you see exactly this. So you have this static shell sequence. You create it one time, and then you just add it to the headers, and then, well, call write and flush, move it through the pipeline, and get a performance boost. And you can also make, make use of this kind of feature for other protocols. Here in Netty 4.0, it's very limited to HTTP, but in 4.1, we abstracted it away. It's now called uh, ASCII string. It's also just a child, uh, child sequence implementation, but you can use it for different protocols. And you not only get the write speed for free, you also get um, some lookup speed for free, because we have now a basic implementation, which is called default HTTP headers which make use of some of the features of the ASCII string, like it knows exactly where the hash or how the hash is computed and where it fits in the special um, default text headers, where in the hash table you don't need to compute it all the time, so it's pretty fast. Yeah, like I said, I mean, what we did was we have this different kind of flushing writing to give you more flexibility. So what we have, we have, we have the, uh, the write, you just move it through the pipeline, we allow to say flush, which means just flush everything that's not written yet to the socket. And we have this kind of shortcut like write and flush, which just says, well, write first and then flush out. And um, while it's a good idea to flush at some points, it's also good to remember that it's very expensive to do. So what you can do with this kind of methods, for example, is do some kind of auto flushing, like you say, well, I want to flush once the outbound buffer has, for example, one MB inside it. Then I want to flush, or when there's some, some tree short hit. And that's pretty easy to implement with this kind of stuff. But like I said, writes are expensive. And also they are dangerous, especially if you have a non-plocking I.O. framework, because most of the times you're used to call write, and if you cannot write, it should plug and will allow you to back up. But that's not true anymore with, with something like non-plocking. You just write, get back a future, and if you don't, well, if you don't be very careful, you may run out of memory very soon, especially if you have a lot of clients and maybe also talk with well, mobile devices with are kind of limited with the bandwidth and all that kind of things because most of the times the server can write a lot faster than the clients can handle it. So this is kind of an example how, it's, how you do something pretty bad. So what it does is we have this channel active method which is triggered once the connection is active like, well, like when you have a socket channel when the connection is 
established to the remote peer. So what we do here is we have a while loop and say, well, why I, while I need to write something, which may be all the time, I will just call write and flush. The problem is when the network stack gets saturated, it may not be possible to write this stuff fast enough, so it backs up and then you may get out of memory exception. So how to fix that? Well, we have this kind of callbacks that helps you to do that. So what we have is uh, a method which is called channel writability changed. But what does it do? Well, it's kind of a callback which get triggered once the writability of a channel changed, which means the channel has some kind of threshold that you can set, which says, well, that's the maximum number of bytes that, you're, that are OK to buffer. After this happens, or after you, well, go over this threshold, this channel writability um, changed. So channel is writable, will return false. We trigger this method. In the method, you can, cha you can check, well, if, cha if channel is writable false, for example, stop writing. And then, once you are able to, well, to write the rest of the stuff, which we will handle for you, because, well, we have registered some kind of callback to the selector to get notified once we can write again. Once you go under a lower threshold, we have two different kinds. We have a high watermark, which means, well, when you go over this, the channel is not writable anymore. And then we have a low watermark, which means you need to drop under this low watermark to come writable again. And then you get triggered again, and then you can just start up writing. And that's basically what we do here in this example. So we have this write if possible method, which takes the channel and then just checks again, like needs to write like before. But then we also check if the, is the channel writable. If yes, continue to write. If not, drop out. And well, start again once the channel writability changed again. And this is how you set this stuff. So what we have is this right buffer high watermark, which is the high, the high buffer mark, and also the low buffer mark. And you can set it per channel. So you can say, for example, I have this high priority channels for high paying customers or whatever. So these are allowed to buffer more. But I also have this kind of, well, free stuff, low paying stuff, whatever. And you can set it on the channel directly. And you can also adjust it on the fly. So if, you're, if you, for example, monitor your system, how much memory is left and this kind of stuff, you could, well, hook in here and just adjust this watermarks on the fly and set it like you want to do it. And you can do that for the client, of course, and for the server. So both is on these slides. The default is uh, 32 kilobytes for the low watermark and 64, I think, for the high watermark. But this may change in future, well, implementations or releases. So just set it to a same number. What we also learned, I mean, Tristan already said that before, is that um, buffer allocation and deallocation is pretty slow and really kind of a pain in the ass. I mean, the whole, the whole problem here is if you want to do high-performing networking on the Java virtual machine, you need to use direct buffers, which are not, well, not located on the heap. And these direct buffers are managed by the garbage collector. The problem is you allocate outside of the heap. So the garbage collector may never run or may not run fast enough. So you use a lot of native memory, off-heap memory, which may be used and you never return fast enough so your application will just crash. For this, well, especially for this, we introduce pool buffers, or pool, a pool byte buff allocator, how we call it. But we got a little bit f uh, faster like this. Even if you don't want to use pool byte buff allocator because it exposes a little bit of a memory overhead because we pull them so we may not release them right away. So if you restrict it on memory usage, you still want to use maybe unpooled. And even for this, we use some kind of, well, unsafe hacks to um, release the direct memory as soon as possible because we're using reference counting. 
So we know exactly when the buffer is not used anymore and we can release the memory right away. We don't need to wait for the garbage collector. So um, it's still a win situation even if you don't use pull byte buffers at all. And um, in Eddy 4.0, the pool byte buffer allocator is not the default one. It's still the unpooled. That's basically just because when we started to release 4.0, um, the pool byte buffer allocator was still pretty new. I mean, it was a completely new feature, and we was not, well, not sure enough if it's really stable, because we was we we rewrote the whole thing or the, wrote the whole thing basically on the paper of Jay Mallock from Facebook and uh, also the body allocation. So it was kind of a new thing. So we was not sure if it's stable enough. So release was unpooled. And that's one of the reasons why we don't change in 4.0 from unpooled to pooled, because we don't want to break, well, user expectations. So in 4.1 and 5.0 and later, the pool pipe buff allocator is used by default. But you can also just switch directly to pool pipe buff allocator or unpooled pipe buff allocator by just setting these uh, channel, well, channel options like shown in the code example below. But my advice is if you use something in production, just use pool pipe buff allocator. It's pretty stable now. We still, well, do a lot of improvement there. We just got a patch from Facebook lately about um, algorithm improvements to uh, allocate bigger buffers fa uh, faster and this kind of thing. So it's still going a lot of improvements there, but it's still really fast now. So just use it. If you can afford the memory, just use it. You may now think that we only pull direct buffers, but that's not true. We, use, we pull direct and heap buffers, or at least we allow to pull both of them. So you can disable one of these, but when you use the pull byte buffer allocator, as default, we pull both. But why we do that? Well, basically, it's because of one of the reasons like Trustin said before. Because when you allocate a new byte array, the Java virtual machine will zero out it. And that's pretty expensive. I mean, pretty expensive is, is all the time. It's, it's kind of a matter what you do with this. But if you allocate a lot of buffers, like a million, whatever, it's pretty expensive to zero out the whole array. And also, you need to, well, get rid of the garbage collection. So once you're done, you need to garbage collect the byte array, the container around it, and all that kind of things. So Twitter did some benchmarks about what that means for performance, if you use the pooled uh, allocator or not the pooled allocator. And that's what you see here. So it's uh, basically published on a blog post that Trustin wrote, I think, last year or this year. I don't remember. Um, but you can, well, check it out if you're interested in the details. I would just say, well, you see here the different colors of graphs. And uh, it's for unpooled and pooled heap and direct buffers. And um, well, smaller graphs are better. And uh, if you, especially if you look at the big buffers like 64 kilobytes, you see um, if you use pooled uh, buffers, it's over a half faster. And that can make really a big difference if you allocate a lot of stuff. Another thing to cons consider is if you write a byte buff, you should always write a direct buffer. <coughs> but why? Well, it's pretty easy. Just check out the OpenJDK and look at the source. If you don't use a direct byte buffer, the OpenJDK and also the Oracle JDK will do a memory copy for you. They will just have a thread local which has byte buffs, direct byte buffs, and if they get a heap byte buff, they will just do a memory copy by themselves for you because otherwise they are not able to pass it to J and I. So whenever you do a write with a heap buffer, you get an extra memory copy. That's pretty expensive. Even with thread locals, it's pretty expensive. So why, why not just use a direct buffer right away? I mean, we have a, a pool direct byte buff with Natty. You get it for free. Just use it. Well, often you need to search in a byte buff. Byte buff is our kind of, well, let me call it byte buffer on steroids. So whenever you use the byte buffer, maybe just ask yourself, did you like it? I don't know. I didn't like it. So um, 
we thought, well, let us expose a better byte buffer. So we introduced our own byte buff, which has a lot of features that are nicer than what you get with byte buffer, at least if you ask me. We have separated a writer in reader index, so you don't need to flip, compact, clear, and this kind of stuff. I mean, how long are you sitting for, for your laptop and debugging because you forgot to flip it? Days, hours, weeks. <laughs> so this doesn't happen with our bulk buffs. And also, because we know how the ranges are in the indexes and all that kind of things, we can allow to really search with high speed and byte buffs. Because every time you do something like buff get byte, you do a range check. I mean, you need to check if the index that is given for a method, well, can you access it inside your byte buff? That's expensive. So what we did was we have uh, something like it's called for each byte, which takes an interface which is called for every byte that is found. And we only need to do the range check one time, and then we know we can iterate for maybe 10 bytes or whatever. So that's a lot faster to do than to get byte all the time. And that works for heap buffers and direct buffers. Another goodie that we have with our byte buff implementation is a composite byte buff. So that basically allows you to wrap many byte buffs into one and have the same API. Not the same like when you use JDK, where you have just an array of byte buffs and need to handle it by yourself. You just expose the same interface, and you don't need to care if it's backed by one byte buff or maybe 10,000, whatever. Well, how often you have messages with payload? I think it's pretty common. Like, you have web sockets where you have the headers. Then you have the payload. You have HTTP, which has the headers. Then you have the content, DNS, which has some kind of payload. I mean, you have it everywhere in almost every protocol out there. So we thought, well, I guess it's a good idea to, to expose some kind of abstraction. So what we have, it's called a byte buff holder, which just says, well, this is a custom message which has a byte buff as his payload. And because we know that, we can make use of reference counting there too. And just don't copy the byte buff, for example, just slice it out. And once you're done, reference counting is is go to zero, and then we can put it back to the pool. No, no need to copy at all. And you get that for free. You just need to extend, for example, default byte buff holder, or just directly implement the interface, and you get all the handling through the channel pipeline of Netty for free. You can just make use of the pools, whatever, without memory copy, and that helps a lot to speed up stuff, right? Well, need to transfer files. For example, FTP server, HTTP, whatever. So we allow to use a zero memory copy, it's called. It's kind of the send file, syscall on, on Linux. So we expose um, an abstraction which is called, um, well, a file region, where you can pass in a file channel and give an offset and what you, need, what you want to write. And then you can just move it through the pipeline, and you will transfer the content of the file without moving from the file to the user space and back to the kernel. You will just handle everything in the kernel. For sure, that only works if you don't need to, well, compress or whatever. So just get the raw content. But that's often, well, good enough or a case, or there are cases where you can do that. And if you need, if you really need to, to do some kind of transformation, we also have, well, a resolution for that. We have the chunked write handler, which basically is an abstraction. So it allows you to, to write um, chunked stream stuff and do all that handling like, well, there's nothing, nothing there to, to write now, write later, and this kind of things all for you. And you can still use uh, SSL encryption and this kind of stuff. But you need to move it from the, the kernel to user space for this. Well, something really important is don't block the event loop. I mean, if you do a thread sleep inside there, well, you sleep. <laughs> I mean, and you not only sleep one connection, you may sleep thousands of connections because we share the threads across them. And also don't use, well, countdown latch and all that kind of goodies that you may be used to, but don't do that with non-plugging or do something else, but don't block. 
Reuse the event loop if you can. I mean, our event loop group is kind of the abstraction like a thread pool. So we have an event loop is backed by one thread and one event loop may handle many different channels to share the resources, threads, whatever. And in Netty3, um, you was not able to really share that stuff pretty good because, for example, if you had a server, we had something which was called the boss. The boss was uh, there for accepting new connections. And then we had this kind of, it was called the worker, which was handling, well, the accepted channels. So you had at least one extra thread for accepting stuff and then the other threads for doing all that kind of things. In Netty4, we abstracted this away to just have the event loop group and you can use it for accepting and also for handling. And even better, you can use it for surfer and for the client. So if you have a surfer and a client in the same application, you can share the same threads over clients and surfers. Just without, well, much overhead, just reuse the stuff. But yeah, you see here how you do it. It's getting even better now. So what is if you need to write a proxy-like application? or something like, well, HTTP server, you have a HTTP server and you need to do a remote networking call. So with Netty3, or before we, we changed the stuff, so what you did is, well, we have this thread which was handling the channel, so the front end channel, we will call like this, and then you need to create another client which you need to use for, well, the remote calling, and this one was sitting on some thread. So whenever you pass data from one to the other, you had some kind of context switching going on because, well, you had no control about threading stuff, which may be pretty expensive and also gives some latency. So this is what, what we see here in, in the proxy handler example. But with Netty4, you can do better because, well, our event loop itself extends event loop group because we say, well, an event loop is an event loop group which has just one member itself. So when you construct a new bootstrap to bootstrap your client, you can just pass in the, same, the event loop of your front end channel, which is basically the accepting channel, and share it with the client that is talking to the remote. So basically, both of them are sitting on the same thread. So you don't have any context switching going on. So if you pass data from one to the other, it's all handled in the same thread. You don't need to worry about concurrently stuff because everything is just handled in one flow, no context switching going on. And um, this helps a lot. You can go even further. I mean, you can even say, well, I have this kind of surfers, backends, they're all sitting on this thread and all of them, the others sitting on that thread and can just balance between them. This is what we see here. So basically what we have is we have a channel active method which get called when a connection comes in. Then we get the inbound channel. And from the inbound channel itself, well, we get the event loop, which is the event loop group, pass it in the bootstrap and then call connect and everything is sh uh, shared on the same thread without context switching. Yeah. Um, operations and channel handlers. So um, basically our channel itself offers some kind of methods like write, write and flush, connect, whatever. And the same is true for the channel handler context, which is well assigned for each channel handler that's moved in the pipeline. Many times you saw in a 3 for example, that users just calling channel write. The problem with that is, well, it's working. It's okay but you always start at the tail of the pipeline and moving through the whole pipeline to the start. So you have some kind of overhead, especially if you have some kind of very composed services with, for example, 16 channel handlers inside there. So you move through all the 16 channel handlers, even if you want to write on the first of them. So what you can do is now, well, you get the channel handler context called write and flush there or write or whatever, and it starts exactly at this channel handler and moves on to the, well, to the channel handler before that, to the head of the pipeline. So you just can write directly from there without the overhead to move to the whole pipeline again. And that also allows you to, well, to make sure that you 
don't call any write method of a handler after that that may not be able to handle the message type you're doing. So you can really like just have a better understanding and well flexibility how you handle this kind of stuff. And that's what you see here. So getting the channel and doing write and flush is most of the times not what you want. Most of the times you just want to get to the channel handler context, call write on that, and that's it. Doing something like this on the channel is most of the times just used if you use want to use the channel from somewhere outside, like a different thread, which is completely <coughs> fine because this kind of stuff is thread safe anyway. Shared st uh, the channel handlers if possible. So um, there are situations where you have a channel handler which has no state at all or is thread, thread safe anyway. Um, what you can do is, well, just annotate it with shareable. This way you tell Netty that it's okay to have the same instance added to different channel pipelines and just share it. This gives you the possibility to share stuff, not create too much garbage collect, uh, garbage which need to be recycled by the garbage collector and this kind of things. Um, well, for example, locking or this kind of stuff is often pretty useful for this kind of things. Remove all the channel handlers fast if you don't need them anymore because every channel handler you have in the pipeline needs to get maybe traversed if you do some write or something like that. So our channel pipeline is, modif uh, is you can modify the channel pipeline on the fly, just do it. If you don't need it anymore, just remove it. We do the same, for example, for our WebSocket stuff. When we upgrade from HTTP to WebSockets, we just remove the HTTP handlers and put in the new WebSocket things. And that's also pretty powerful to write kind of multiplexes where you have multiple protocols on one port. You can just detect which protocol it is, remove the multiplex uh, multiplexer, put in the right protocol handler, and that's it. While we removed this kind of um, the message event that we had before, this kind of using an event for every I.O., which allowed you to, well, pass stuff through the pipeline, we also introduced something which is called a user event. So again, we have um, a method which is called user event triggered in the inbound handler, and you can fire through any pocho through the pipeline just to have handlers handle your custom stuff. So. For example, we use this kind of things for the idle state handler. We have something that's called an idle state handler. And once the connection idle for whatever time, we just pass in an idle state event and the user can override this user event trigger, check the instance of stuff, and then do a close connection, whatever. And you can also do this with things for handshaking. We use that for SSL handshaking, for WebSockets when the up when the upgrade is well complete and this kind of thing. So it's pretty flexible for your protocol also. Use a proper buffer type in the encoder. So we have something that's called the um, message to byte encoder, which basically takes a pocho and gives you a byte buff where you can write in directly because you need to, well, convert from pocho to the byte buff to get it on the wire. So um, by default, we try to use a direct buffer most of the times if the system is able to allocate more. But you have sometimes some API that only take an array, for example, which is not possible if you have a direct byte buff. So you can pass in some constructor argument to a um, message to byte encoder to tell him to prefer an heap buffer, which has an array, which we, for example, use for um, doing our compression stuff because deflate, inflate, and this kind of things, they don't expose any API to use a byte buffer. They want to have an array. And this saves you a byte copy, basically. Well, you, still, you may still need to do a byte copy if it's the last handler in the chain to get a direct byte buffer. Sometimes you may have a compression handler, and after that you have an SNL handler, for example, which need to, well, copy that stuff anyway. And this way you can just get rid of one byte copy. And that's what you see here. So, we tell it, well, use false, so the byte buff is backed by an array, we know that, so we can get the array directly, get the offset in the array, and write directly to it.
In 83, it was not possible to um, do reading by your own. So what we did in 83 was when there was something on the wire, we just dispatched it through the handler and you need to handle it. Sometimes that's not good enough. Sometimes you need to, well, you want to say, well, I'm interested now to get data and that's it. And now I'm again interested and now I'm again and this kind of thing. So more like for flow control, for example, or kind of flow control. So in 84, we are now able to um, use Auto reading or not auto reading. Default is use auto read, which means every every time there's something to read, we will fire through the pipeline. But you can also disable that, which means Netty will wait for you to call channel read to try to read something when it's ready. And that's pretty handy, for example, if you implement some kind of a proxy, because you can just stop reading if the remote peer cannot accept more data. And once the remote peer was able to get all the data, you can just trigger a new write, a new read. So it's kind of helps you with back pressure stuff. And you can also change that on the fly. And you can set it per channel. So some can use it, some cannot use it. It really depends on what you need. Like Justin said, we have a lot of, well, I don't know if it's a lot of, but we have some native stuff in Netty 4 now. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, we have this open SSL based SSL uh, engine, which is basically, well, kind of based on the work of Twitter. They did in Finagle, which is a forked version of the, na uh, of the Tomcat native stuff. But now it's part of Netty, so they contributed to it and uh, we, well, cooperate into the build which means we now expose an SSL API, a factory, to allow you to well, create a new SSL engine without very too much, if it's an open SSL engine or the JDK SSL engine, the API is still the same for all of them. So you just drop in the jar and it works. It only works for surface sites so far because, well, we didn't implement it yet for, for client sites, but, well, we love contributions, so feel free. Um, we wrote a native transport for Linux, uh, which is ePol edge triggered for lowest latency and throughput. Um, Google is using it in production for their open, open bidder. I think it's called open bidder, right? Yeah, open bidder platform. They use this one. And um, also, because we have full control over the, the, the native stuff, we are able to handle writes and reads uh, without creating too much garbage because we can make use directly of the memory address and its kind of things. But it only works on Linux. But most of the people are running the production Linux anyway, so I guess it's a good fit. We also support um, different kind of things there that are not possible with JDK, like a reuse port, which allows you to bind many different sockets to the same address and then accepting this on the different sockets in a round robin like nature. That's pretty useful if you write um, a UDP based protocol because if you don't do that, you basically use UDP with one thread all the time. And there's some, uh, some white paper about this um, when Google was, well, introduced this for the kernel as patch. Um, and it's pretty interesting how much more packets they was able to handle with this kind of stuff. And we expose it now for, in Netty for free. It only works from uh, kernel 3.9 upwards, but I think you should run on these kind of kernels anyway now. Uh, and we also use uh, support TCP cork. So for TCP cork, you are able to use send file and write the headers with less system calls. So basically just transfer it um, well, with one network package, for example, without too much round dripping stuff going on, you can just enable that. And still the same API. So if you switch from using a JDK um, non blocking IO API with Netty with the transport and the native one, it's basically the same API. We just expose extra configuration options here. And here you see how you, how you switch it. It's pretty easy. I mean, Above, you see, you just use uh, NIO event loop group, which is basically JDK NIO, and set the channel class on that. And well, below, you see how you switch to the native transport. So it's just two lines of code, and that's it. 
And now we even um, have some kind of helper method which allows you to, to detect if you can use the native stuff. So we have something which is called ePoll is ready or is available, I think it's called, which returns true or false if you can use it. So it's pretty easy, drop in replacement. Yeah, last call. <laughs> That's in basically for my publisher. I'm writing a book, make me rich. I want to retire. Uh -huh. So I guess everyone from you need to buy one million books or so. <laughs> yeah, choking, choking aside, if you want to know more about Netty and uh, well, need more documentation, whatever. I mean, we are already working on getting the documentation better at Netty. But um, this is kind of a full book on Netty. Yeah, and that's basically it. You'd, a little bit of references about well licensing stuff and um, how the slides are generated and this kind of things. But that's basically it. So feel free to ask questions. So the question was if it's possible to get notified when something is trained on the buffer. For example, if you have a channel and you can only partly write the buffer, right? Yeah, you can do that. So basically what we have is when you call write, um, we have two different write methods. One which just take an object as a message, but we also have an overloaded one which takes a channel promise, which is our, well, writable part of the channel future itself. And we have something that is called a channel, progress, a channel progressive promise, which allows you to register a listener which is notified for progressive rights, like there you, you are able to write 10 bytes, you get notified, you're able to you get notified for 20 bytes, whatever, and then once it's done, you get notified one time more, this kind of stuff, so you can get feedback how much stuff is written, yeah. Well, the, the question was, um, what, what are the ideas, so what we maybe want to move to other languages, right? Well, basically, I mean, it's just an idea for now, but, um, we are fighting, well, we, I don't know if, if I want to call it we have troubles, but we are kind of still fighting with GC pressure all the time. So we have a lot of problems with option creation. Well, not really option creation, it's more like, well, recycle them. And um, what is really interesting about Rust here is that it allows you to well, run with garbage collection or not run with garbage collection, so you can just release the stuff right away and for example if you look at our uh, pool byte buffers we have a good idea most of the times when we are done res with resources anyway so um, it may be a good fit for us I don't know if, I don't know if trust is the answer to the question but we are at least trying to well to experiment a little bit with different language to get a better idea what we can do because if we end up to do everything with JNI <laughs> I mean, we can also just do with C anyway, so, yeah, because J and I is not really fun. I mean, yeah, it's true. It's not, it's not, uh, though the question was, um, because Preston and me both said, well, zero out the memory is not for free and this kind of stuff and overhead. Um, it's nearly for free with assembler. It's very fast. Sure, it's pretty fast, but it's not only, the problem is not only zero out the memory, it's also um, garbage collect the array itself. So um, that's, I mean, we, we pull the array itself. So we, create, we don't need to recycle one object for each allocation, and that's one of the main reasons. I mean, it's also true that zero out the buffers has some overhead, at least. Because, I mean, if you think about it, you put a you put container around it anyway, like a byte buff or a byte buffer because you want to fill it in. So it's kind of wasteful to first fill it and then override it again. I mean, I can think of that it may make sense for security reasons, whatever, because you may be able to read something that was written there before. But if you are in a controlled environment, I think most of the times you don't care too much about this. So. Anyway, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, know, it's, it's. I heard that zeroing takes a long time and it's just not like, you know, well, it doesn't have to. Yeah, that's true. It's not only zeroing. It's one of the, uh, well, one of the things that, that we think it's not needed. And uh, the other thing is, 
well, yeah, release that stuff back or get it released by the garbage collector because, I mean, most of the objects that we had in, in Net 3 was pretty short-living objects. And um, many people say that garbage collect short-living objects are, is pretty fast or whatever. And that's true, it's pretty fast, but sometimes it's still not fast enough. Because when you push stuff hard enough, well, you produce a lot of garbage and really a lot. And uh, for networking services, we are more interested to put stuff off heap anyway, because otherwise, well, we need to do memory copy and we don't want to do that. So yeah, we try hard to minimize all that garbage collection stuff. Thanks guys. Thank